start and count. Good evening, everyone. My name is Allison Green, Manager of External Exhibitions and Public Programs. Thank you for joining us tonight for the League's live talk series. And our additional thanks to the New York City Department of Cultural Affairs, whose generous support helps make this series possible. Tonight is the League's inaugural live talk on YouTube, and this program will conclude with a Q&A. So please ask your questions and leave us your comments in the live chat on this YouTube feed. I will be reading audience questions aloud. Tonight's program topic begins at Museum of Art DeLand in DeLand, Florida, which recently opened the exhibition Humanity in Art, a retrospective of paintings by longtime league instructor Jerry Weiss. While the exhibition takes place in Florida, we are bringing the story of Jerry's work to New York to discuss how humanity and art came to be and how this exhibition relates to Jerry's extensive body of work. Before we begin, please allow me to introduce tonight's presenter, Jerry Weiss. Jerry studied drawing with Roberto Martinez in Miami, Florida, and drawing and painting with Harvey Dinerstein, Robert Beverly Hale, Ted Seth Jacobs, Mary Beth McKenzie, and Jack Faragasso at the Art Students League and the National Academy of Design in New York City. His paintings are represented in numerous public, private, and corporate collections, including New Britain Museum of American Art, University of Pennsylvania, and the Harvard Club of New York City. Jerry's artwork and teaching methods have been featured in American Artist Workshop and American Art Artist Drawing magazines, and he is a longtime contributor to the Artist Magazine. He is represented by the Chester Gallery, Chester, Connecticut, Elizabeth Moss Gallery, and Cooper and Smith Gallery, Essex, Connecticut, and Portraits, Inc. Without further hesitation, please welcome Jerry Weiss. Jerry, thank you for being here tonight. Take it away. Allison, thank you so much for that uh, lovely introduction. Uh, and uh, I want to start with the thank yous. Um, thank you to the Art Students League for um, facilitating this, uh, for having the idea to do this. Uh, thank you to Andrew Drillon and to Rudy Bravo for um, all their support and their backup help with this. Um, it's, it's a pleasure to be doing a talk uh, in, in association with the League, where I've taught for almost a decade now, and where I have roots that go back further, which we'll get into um, in a few minutes. I also obviously want to thank the Museum of Art DeLand uh, for putting together this exhibition of 40 years of my painting. Um, the exhibition came about uh, first and foremost through the auspices of George Bolgi, who's the former CEO uh, at DeLand. And before that, who I knew when he was a director of several other museums in South Florida in the area where I grew up uh, and about 22 years ago, uh, George uh, welcomed me to uh, the museum he was then the director at in the form of a landscape painting show. We talked about this show at DeLand as being comprised of both figures and landscapes. And so originally I sent George slides of a hundred paintings, uh, which it was understood he would narrow down to 50. And when the narrowing done uh, the narrowing down came, uh, it was 25 figures and 25 landscapes. And as the months passed and George looked at uh, the images of my work more, he decided that he, he really wanted to write about uh, and was more interested in my figure and portrait work. So um, I took it upon myself to change the, uh, the allocation, the distribution of subject matter and ended up removing some of the landscapes and adding some figures. So the show is almost two thirds portrait and figure now. Um, sometimes folks ask me, what do I prefer painting? Uh, and and I, I like both. It's, it's like choosing between children. Uh, they both satisfy uh, certain requirements for me uh, as a painter. Um, but I'm very happy to go with the idea of uh, the figure foremost. It's, it's really where I started as a serious artist, um, drawing and painting people. Uh, and uh, when I started taking life classes, it was down in Miami. 
when I was 17, took figure drawing classes that really reinforced the importance of the subject to me and, and how just how much I enjoyed it how much I enjoy drawing the figure and still do. Um, the, the title of the show, Humanity in, in Art, is not something that I dreamed up. Uh, I would find it hard to describe my work that way because, um, well, I just think it's best to let the paintings speak for themselves. But that was uh, George Bolgi's idea, I believe. And um, I, I suppose it's an apt description of my interests, but. Uh, as I said, I'd rather have the work speak for itself. If there's any quality of um, uh, humanism or um, uh, all the things that, that kind of go with that, I'm, I'm a little bit hesitant to take those on because I'm afraid it might sound a little bit pretentious coming from the artist. Um, suffice to say, uh, I, I, I like spending time drawing and painting people from life full stop period. <laughs> uh, I, I think that's a um, probably a good place for me to to, um, to stop the introduction uh, and as we move forward, Allison, uh, and we can we can talk and we can go through some images and uh, I'd be happy to field questions. So I, I think we're starting with um, uh, with some uh, influences, if I'm not mistaken, the that images of influences. Right. Yeah, so I'm pulling up the PowerPoint now so that we can go through some of these images. Thank you, Jerry, first for um, walking us through how this exhibition came to be. The title slide that we're looking at here, we see a couple of installation shots so that we have a sense of, you know, what is the space that your works are occupying? And is it, did it wind up being 50 works total in the show or is it parred back from that? No, we, we ended up with 50, I think exactly 50 works, 49 oils, and one very large hard pastel drawing, which you can see on the far left in the left-hand shot here. It's, oh, a, yeah. it's almost a life-size figure that I drew uh, while I was teaching a figure drawing class and worked alongside the students one night. So that pastel was done in, um, in a couple of hours alongside students. Um, so 50 is a pretty good overview. And I chose paintings that would take, that would take the viewer from, from my first year out of art school mm. up until almost the present day. I believe the most recent paintings are from 2019. Oh, wow. Before the, um, before the pandemic broke and, and everything kind of went quiet for a while. Yeah. So let's start by going back. As you mentioned, we'll begin by reviewing some images that you consider to be some of your main influences. Um, so as you describe these works to us. Um, my main question for you, Jerry, is simply what defines your style and how are these influence images we're looking at helping you to build this style? Um, before we begin as well, a reminder to our watching audience, please share with us your comments, but especially your questions for the audience Q&A by using the live chat. So let's begin, Jerry, with our first influence. All right. Uh, it, it, to, to partially answer your question, I, I don't know how to define my style. And I, I think I, I generally like to leave that to other people unless they get it so horribly wrong that I feel the need to intervene. Um, because it, it, a painter can spend their whole lives trying to uh, explain what they're doing and it'll, it'll end up taking you away from your work. You, mm -hmm. you finally just have to do it. I, I um, submitted here a, a batch of early influences. I, I didn't really go beyond the age of um, my early 20s. Because frankly, we could spend the whole evening talking about influences, but I, I set out to, to pluck an incomplete list of very early influences. And the first one I'm starting with is a cartoon by my father. Uh, Morris Weiss was a um, professional cartoonist, a, a very accomplished cartoonist. And, and I know just growing up in the house uh, with, with him working at the drawing board, lettering and drawing and inking and coming up with gags and stories uh, is probably the most formative uh, experience that a young artist can have. So this is an early cartoon by, um, by him. Uh, and I think it shows very well his, his accomplishment with pen and ink. Definitely. Um, the next one is a, um, is a painting that my mother did as a student at the Art Students League. And to, to backpedal just for a moment, my mother and father met at the league when they were both 
um, in George Bridgman's class. This was 1940. And um, my father was already a young man working professionally as a cartoonist. My mother was just out of high school. She had a scholarship. They actually met in the second floor gallery right outside of Bridgman's classroom because wow. um, my mother found Bridgman too rough and she stopped going to the classes because it, it was too, she didn't like him erasing her drawings. <laughs> so that's where my father saw her in the gallery. And, uh, uh, and after an on and off courtship, they ended up marrying about, <laughs> I think four years later. Um, but this is a painting she did 40 years later. She came back to the league around 1980. And um, uh, when she finally had the freedom to work a little bit on her own, my parents would come up from South Florida and summer in the New York City area. And my mother took some, a few months of classes with Yui Lee Smith, who was a wonderful teacher and a, and a wonderful artist. Uh, and this is one of the pieces that, that I own uh, that my mother painted in that class. Um, so this sets the stage to say, this is some of what, this is the atmosphere I grew up in. Uh, and let we go to the next one. My father was not only a cartoonist, he was a collector of American illustration. Mm -hmm. And he amassed a truly um, remarkable collection of, of drawings and paintings. This was a Norman Rockwell post cover that used to hang uh, in our rec room in South Florida. Uh, so I would look at this every day and um, think on the one hand, uh, how could I become technically that accomplished? Mm -hmm. And on the other hand, boy, I, I never wanna be an illustrator. <laughs> how did that thought come to you? It seems like it was the realism that you were attracted to, but there's, there's something about this that you identified as not a goal that you have? Uh, exactly. Um, I, I think from an early age, whether I intuited it or, or knew it intellectually, uh, whatever level it was, I knew that I wanted to work for myself mm. and not, not on assignment for other people. Mm -hmm. um, and I didn't, I, I, early on, I, I mean, from the time I'm a preteen, I had a sense that uh, I wasn't interested in telling obvious stories. I wasn't interested in illustrating somebody's narrative. Mm. Um, I wasn't interested in, um, uh, in, in, in obvious sentiment. I, I, I think I always had this sense from, from a very early age, before I could really paint, that, that it was more interesting just to observe the world and put down mm. what I saw in, in a in a fair and humane way. Now, I, I, I couldn't have given words to that when I was 12 or 13, but that's certainly what was percolating. The, the next um, image or two or other illustrations that I grew up with. This is a, a marvelous J.C. Leyendecker post cover that hung uh, over my bed when I was a child. Oh. Uh, and it, it's absolutely remarkable. And I, I'm sure I learned from looking at it uh, uh, ideas and, and, and concepts about how to kind of uh, um, paint a three-dimensional figure mm -hmm. and how to give form. But Lion Decker was highly stylized and my father and I would sometimes have discussions, who do, who's better, Lion Decker or Rockwell? <laughs> <laughs> Until I got to the, to the terrible age of like 16 or 17 and just said, ah, it's all illustration, don't bother me. <laughs> where, where I just become, I, I became overtly dismissive. And in a way that, that had to happen because, you know, especially at that age, one has to strike out and find their own voice anyway. Um, so, but, but it would also be, as I was saying to you yesterday, it would be dishonest for me to pretend this isn't part of my childhood, even, even as, uh, as I walked away from it. You know, this is very much a part of my background. Um, so let's go to the next one, please. This I really did like. Um, in my later teens, my father started collecting Dean Cornwell's work. And this was one of my favorite Cornwell's. And I remember my dad coming to me with a little photograph one day that he got from a gallery in New York and asking me, should I buy this? And I said, well, you know, it wasn't my money. So I said, absolutely. <laughs> um, and, and I think I, I, Cornwell was, was sat well with me and still does because of his paint handling uh, because of how well he draws the figure, how well he composes an interior. Uh, and because regardless of the subject narrative, the subject matter or the narrative, uh, there's something about Cornwell that comes through his work that's kind of ambiguous uh, and kind of even a little bit dark. And I think that always appealed to me. 
Yeah. Seems like that ambiguity has a nice contrast to this idea of working on commission and, and very explicitly telling narratives. There's a little bit more um, enigma in this. Oh, exactly. And and there's there's the hint of kind of French painting in this, the way he drags uh, the, the paint across. I'm presuming that he painted over a previous canvas, just looking at the texture of it and the way he deals with pattern, something very painterly and, and maybe a bit European about it. Uh, anyway, this appealed to me a great deal and it still does. Wow, that's great detail. Um, again, making some of the comparisons of influences more overt, mm. uh, a, a portrait head by Degas that has absolutely um, inflamed me for the last almost 50 years since I first saw a little paperback book. It is so beautiful and so classic and so subtle and, and so devoid of obvious narrative. Uh, it's just the most beautiful observation. And on the right is a painting uh, of mine done in my uh, mid twenties, where certainly the, the Degas is in the back of my mind. It's not a conscious influence. Right. Very few of these influences are conscious. They're things that stick in our minds and then they inform aspects of our work going forward. And that's true with this, this marvelous Degas head. Um, Degas' paintings of friends, colleagues uh, in their studios. He did a lot of them when he was young. And I really kind of drafted off of that because I thought it was a marvelous idea. And, and I was not um, uh, unaware of what I was doing in my early 20s. Uh, I, I actually thought it was kind of part of my calling was to, was to be journalistic. And my journalism at that point was about um, describing the artists who I knew and admired or were friends with and painting them in their studio surrounded by their work. Mm -hmm. uh, and as if there was no such thing as photography, I decided it was important for an artist to paint these environments and to share them. Um, Thomas Eakins was important to me as a young painter and one of a number of academic influences that, that were very much on my mind when I was starting to um, uh, work from the figure uh, at the League and at the National Academy when I was 19, 20, and 21. And this is a marvelous, uh, very powerful Eakins that's, uh, I believe, in the Philadelphia Museum. Mm -hmm. And I, I, as, a, as a youngster, a youngster, I mean, in my late teens and early 20s, there were occasional field trips to Philadelphia um, from the New York area. I would make field trips just to look at all the Eakins, among them his student works that they had up. And, um, this was a, um, this is a student work from about 200 years ago, uh, a French academic figure that's at the Metropolitan Museum in New York. And it used to be one of my uh, stopping points when I visited the Met as a young artist, because this represented to me so much of the best of what I thought of as traditional academic figure painting. Mm. And at the time it, it had a fairly prominent place in the European galleries because it was ascribed to Theodore Jericho. And that has since been rescinded and now it's an unknown artist and they no longer hang it up. <laughs> oh, wow. Um, I haven't seen it in years. I, I'd be surprised, maybe somebody knows, maybe they've seen it recently at the museum. But as I say, it used to be one of the objects of my affection when I went to the Met, there, was, there were the, the Degas and there were the, uh, the Rembrandts and the Eakins and the Winslow Homers. And, and this held a special place. Oh, well, very powerful, very, <laughs> very beautifully done. It completely supplanted um, the illustrations, the wonderful illustrations I grew up with. Here yeah. to me was a real, you know, a demonstration of, of real um, representational painting. Let's go to the next one, please. This too, George Bellows became um, important to me early on. Uh, again, for some of the reasons I already mentioned about his, um, his take on, uh, on life around him as encouraged by his teacher and friend, Robert Henry, uh, to paint New York as he saw it. But there's a tremendous liveliness in Bellows' best work um, that makes it irresistible. And uh, a more contemporary artist who was very important to me 
uh, I visited Raphael Slayer twice as, as, at his studio in the mid 1980s mm -hmm. uh, and, and enjoyed speaking with him and, uh, um, uh, and, and really borrowed freely uh, from the mood of his work, especially when I was younger. Uh, and I've often come to think of these borrowings not as uh, an intent to emulate another artist, but the pleasure an artist has when they find a kindred spirit. Mm -hmm. And the kindred spirit perhaps got to the idea before I was born. <laughs> but, but that doesn't mean that I don't want to acknowledge the similarity of thought. And as I say, for, for me, Sawyer had touched on ground uh, be well before me that, that really interested me and really resonated with me personally. Uh, again, this is, this is um, a larger view on the right of the same painting that we saw the detail of a couple of minutes ago. And now I'm showing the whole thing to, to, to evidence a very subconscious influence. And that's a, a wonderful triangular pyramidal composition by Balthus. Uh, and there was no conscious attempt to lift this from him. Um, but in retrospect, and that's what art historians do, they tend to operate in retrospect. I looked at my painting and I said, my goodness. I mean, it's clear that, that without realizing it, I, I must have been thinking of this painting while I was painting mine. Yeah, I love this insight that you have that the influences are subconscious. It's almost like you're being reminded of a dream or a very deep memory as you're working organically. I think that's very important to say because what, what art historians, what academics and perhaps even artists tend to do is think that there's, there's a clear line from A to B mm -hmm. in, in assigning influences. And I'm aware of that even when I'm writing about art and writing reviews to be careful about that because the truth is it's often messier and less direct than we think when we're looking at artists' work and, and often much more subliminal. The same thing with the next painting. There's, <laughs> there's, there's a Thomas Eakins, a gesture and a portrait of his, an unfinished portrait that stuck in my head when I was a young painter. Mm. I, I did not say to myself, I'm going to paint a figure with a similar disposition uh, of the arms. You know, it, it happened. In fact, the painting that I did on the right, the composition began differently with a, with a dark background and the figure looking directly at us, which probably harkens even more directly to the Eakins. But truth be told, I, I don't think there was any um, uh, premeditated attempt to say, I'm going to redo an Eakins composition. It just happens. Yeah. What's next? Uh, so uh, when I was studying in New York, I, I got wind of, I'd been at the league for a while and I got wind that Harvey Dinnerstein was teaching at the National Academy, which was only a few minutes walk from where I was living at the time in Manhattan on the Upper East Side. And um, this was the painting that was hanging up at the National Academy at that time. Uh, and it, it helped sell me on studying with Harvey, uh, not because I wanted to paint like that, but because I really respected and was drawn to um, Harvey's humanism mm. uh, and Harvey's interest in people uh, and even his social, um, uh, his, his take on social uh, subjects, if you will, um, socially relevant subjects, uh, even though I never went in that direction overtly with my own art. Uh, I, I really liked uh, being around him and listening to him. Uh, and knowing uh, what he was about. And that was important to me. Yeah, it sounds like another opportunity for that osmosis of, you know, being um, sort of su subtextually and subconsciously influenced. It, exactly, Allison. I, I think a lot of students uh, probably go to teachers with the, with the idea, maybe I can learn to draw and paint like X. Yeah. And, and that was never my interest. My interest was I, I want to draw and paint like me you know, whatever that means, but how interesting to be able to bounce off of these other people, to be able to study with this person and see where they're going and what they have to contribute. Um, this was a, um, this is a drawing that Harvey did of the same subject, a uh, mm -hmm. Mr. Meltzer. And I found this online uh, years ago and, and purchased it. So it's part of my collection too. 
And I just think it's a wonderful charcoal. Uh, and then Harvey introduced me when I was a student to the work of Mary Beth McKenzie, the next slide. Uh, and um, I saw a show of hers in New York around 1981 or so uh, that, that Harvey recommended to his class. And I went and saw it and I was just very taken by her work. Uh, and again, by the, by the idea that here was somebody who was painting, uh, who was painting in, in, a, in a way that interested me, you know, that, that was simpatico with, with what I saw and felt. Uh, and she was doing it so very well. And I think this is the last under influences. This, this is a very close influence. This was uh, uh, my partner at the time when we were in our twenties. Uh, Susan Mazer was a, was a terrific artist whose work I'm only appreciating more as I get older. Uh, but we painted side by side in, in a little apartment in uh, New Jersey. And this is one of my favorite paintings of hers, a self-portrait um, painted in our, uh, uh, in, in our living room, what could charitably be called a living room. It was, <laughs> it was just a, another place to, to, to pile up paintings and to put stuff. Um, but um, I, I think I'm probably still in some ways learning uh, you know, from, from these pictures and from a painting like this, which I just, um, I think what a, what a beautifully, what a beautifully drawn um, and beautifully colored example. So sometimes the, um, the influences are right there as they've been, I've been fortunate to have within my own family and with, with friends and colleagues right, right close by. So we're about to transition into going into some of your works in the exhibition, talking a little bit more about humanity and art itself. Um, but I want to pause on this idea of, you know, you're continuing to learn from these influences, knowing that our last few slides have been the work of League instructors. Can you take a moment to just briefly tell us your League story? When were you first a student here? And, uh, you know, what was your art student into artist transition like? Okay, um, I, I guess I started at the League in late 1978 and, um, and studied the League probably through 81. Mm -hmm. I know I was there for three solid years, 79, 80, 81, because I know that those three years I, I lived in New York City. Um, so three school years at the League, I knew about it obviously because of my mother and my father. Mm -hmm. And I, I came up, we did a reconnaissance when I was a teenager and I checked the league out uh, and it seemed okay. Uh, and um, I had studied a year in Florida beforehand with, a, with Roberto, drawing teacher. Uh, and I came up to the league thinking, thinking thoughts like, you know, I'm going to own this place and this and that. Well, the first year was an absolute travesty because I was away from home for the first time in my life. Mm. And um, I was just, I was just in a mess. And I couldn't draw and paint half as well as I thought I should have. So I, I was just, in some ways, I was terribly unhappy that first year. Uh, but I, the thought never entered my mind to stop going. Hmm. You know, I, I know I wanted to continue. And, and even though I couldn't find the right teachers the first year, in fact, the first year I just stopped painting because I couldn't find a painting teacher that really worked for me. Hmm. So I stopped painting altogether and I just continued going to Robert Beverly Hills class to study drawing. And Hale was, of course, brilliant, and he was very kind. Um, and then in the second year, it kind of clicked. I found some different teachers, and uh, I started to enjoy the process more. And my painting got a little bit better. Um, I, I got more comfortable with it. I was comfortable as a draftsman, but now I was learning how to use paint. Uh, and that went a bit better. And by the third year, uh, along with a few colleagues, uh, students about my age, um, you know, it got into my mind that, that now, now I own the place, <laughs> you know, uh, as, as students will do after a few years and, and you think you're really good and it's like, you know, big shot. Sure. I imagine that might be a little cyclical too, to sort of go through periods of, of feeling like you've really reached a new level and then almost feeling a, a start again as you have new goals. Absolutely. And, and the start again, the, the reality check came, uh, as I often tell my students, not because I had learned everything I was going to learn at the league, but because at 21, um, I decided I was tired of painting setups 
that were designed by other students mm. uh, and sharing the model with 25 other people. I wanted to work on my own and develop, uh, even if the idea was only subtly different, you know, mm -hmm. I was still interested in painting people yeah. sitting around, if you will, but I wanted to do it in my own space, on my own time, with my own thoughts, not, not dictated by somebody else's clock. And, and that was a real, um, uh, initially a real comeuppance because it, it wasn't very easy to find people who would sit for me. Um, and I didn't have money to burn hiring models. Sure. So the first few years out of school uh, were an education in that respect. Yeah. Well, so that sounds like a great transition into some of the first of your works that we'll be looking at in detail here. Um, so let's start here. And I think this is really where the, the end of the art school story picks up. Is that right? Very much so. Uh, this, is, this is Susan, who you just saw in her self-portrait. And this is... Um, this is, might be the very first painting I did in our apartment when we moved in together in New Jersey. So this is probably uh, 1981, mm -hmm. late 81, just after we moved in. The space is pretty empty. Um, and, uh, and I think this, this shows some of the derivation of Raphael Sawyer. I think it's pretty pronounced mm -hmm. uh, in, in an early painting like this. Um, so again, it's about, uh, it's about leaving school. It's about working with other artists. And, uh, and we posed a lot for each other for the next seven years or so. Free models. <laughs> uh, helps to have in network. And, and the same here. This is from 1984, a few years later, uh, when I um, uh, strengthened a friendship with a fellow student from the National Academy. I had met Catherine Scott in, um, I think, in Mary Beth McKenzie's class because I went back to the National Academy for a few months to study with Mary Beth. I'd left school, then returned. Uh, and then uh, Catherine and I spent the entire spring of 1984 painting each other. I think I got by far the better of the deal because uh, she, was, she was wonderfully um, picturesque and she had a great wardrobe of, um, of clothes she had bought from Milan. And per my taste at the time, I wasn't interested in painting her in any of those. I was painting her basically in her rags that she was throwing out. <laughs> that was the stuff that interested me, not the high fashion business. Sure, I can see it though. This is a large painting. This is 60 by 40. Wow. Uh, and um, yeah. Most of the works in humanity and art are, are quite large, right? I'm gonna move us on onto this, but uh, <laughs> they are generally pretty sizable, is that right? I like working as close to life size as I can, and that doesn't mm -hmm. always happen. But I, I, I do like going, you know, what, what, what most painters would consider large, I suppose. This is um, 32 by 32. Mm -hmm. uh, and this was painted in uh, the early 90s, 91, in a studio that I shared on Union Square in Manhattan. It was a, a 12th floor um, studio with, with a skylight. And I love the, uh, the motif, the idea of including the skylight kind of balanced at the top of my head. So I put the mirror down on the floor and leaned it against something. So I get wow. that wonderful angle. Um, and, and the blue that you see underneath the underpainting is actually uh, the residue from a Brooklyn Bridge painting that I had painted outside that summer that didn't work out. Um, so as I've done so many times, uh, just recycled the canvas. A uh, fellow artist, a fellow leaky, David Penna, who a lot of uh, Art Students League uh, students and teachers will remember, uh, who's very colorful, very talented. Uh, and we um, had studios in the same building. And we were good friends through our 20s and early 30s. Uh, and this is Dave posing one day at the studio, more than one day. Uh, mm -hmm. I'm guessing this is four or five sessions, probably, that he sat for this. And in the best tradition of, of young painters in the city, I'm sure he would sit for this for an hour or two, and then we go out and get a meal and then just hang out the rest of the day doing nothing. <laughs> that sounds great. <laughs> 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 this was painted in the New York studio too. This, this with a, um, a hired model mm. who was wonderful. I did several paintings of her, uh, but it, it, it also, um, 
responds to a, to a compositional idea that, that goes back to the earlier Degas influence. Uh, how many paintings I set up with canvases behind the models. Yeah. With paintings. The, the painting behind her is actually was done by um, Tom Lepp, who I shared the studio with, who taught for a year at the League uh, okay. and who was a, um, a wonderful painter. Uh, I got to know him in the early 90s. And uh, as I say, we shared that studio space for a while. I'm so interested in this idea of like a whole series of works that are depicting studios and these active artist spaces and knowing that you're sharing studio space with artists. You say this is a model who was hired. So is this a time that you that your career was also transitioning? Were you now in a position where you are able to hire models? And are you working on commissions? Or where is your art at this point? Uh, I was, you know, haltingly getting portrait commissions. Uh, and I say haltingly because it's always for me, it's always been a rather tough haul because the, the, the bulk of portrait commissions go to artists who work from photography mm. and I work from life. Mm -hmm. So I don't, I don't have to worry about portrait commissions taking up too much of my time. <laughs> <laughs> they come through sporadically, but, but from time to time, there would be some of that. I hadn't started teaching yet. In mm -hmm. fact, at this point, I didn't even think about teaching. Uh, that, that came a few years later. Um, but, but every once in a while, I had the wherewithal to either hire a model or, or with one of my friends, share a model. Um, and were maybe a couple, a couple times a week, yeah. Uh, were you interested in seeing your work in any particular context at this point, knowing this is pre your teaching career? Um, do you recall your first exhibition of works or, or where you were trying to, to exhibit? My first ex exhibition was actually a two person show with my friend, Susan. We had a show at A.M. Adler Fine Art on the Upper East Side. It was a lovely little gallery that was owned by Abraham Adler of Herschel and Adler. And it was kind of, this is kind of a little side hustle. It was a side gallery. Um, and at that time, uh, one of his daughters was running it. And she really liked my work. And she had Susan and I show our work there. And, and we were so proud we would drive in from New Jersey and, and just sit at the gallery like almost every day when the show was up. There might be no one coming through, but we'd come and sit for two or three hours and just luxuriate in the fact that here we were, uh, a couple of artists in our mid twenties, and, and we had a show in Manhattan. And I think more importantly, we, I think we were both proud of the work we were doing. I certainly mm -hmm. felt very good about it. Uh, I had no idea any more than I know today, uh, the, the trajectory of my work or of the public conception of it. You, sure. you just go to the studio and you do your thing. Yeah, that's a really gratifying thought uh, for, you know, probably a lot of artists are tuning in tonight. And I think it really is another great point to be making um, that it doesn't necessarily have to be result goal oriented, but it's the love of the practice and following it where it leads. That's it. And if I could, if I could get to a point in a painting where I'd say, man, I think this would just look great to show somewhere. And that's as far as my train of thought went. Mm. You know, it's like, I think this looks terrific. Uh, I'd feel really proud to have this scene. That was it. I, I really have never thought any further than that, which explains why I'm such a terrible business person. <laughs> Let me keep us going here. This, this marks a transition because this I painted soon after moving to Connecticut in the mid 90s. I started teaching um, finally uh, after a few offers uh, to teach, which I turned down because I was too young in previous years. In the mid nineties, I started teaching in a small college, uh, the Lyme Academy in Old Lyme, Connecticut. Uh, and this was um, Lori who I met um, when I started teaching in Connecticut. Uh, and um, it, it, it kind of represents unintentionally, not only the transition from city to country life, but, but kind of an entire new, um, it's, it's no longer students and artists sitting around in artist studios now. Sure. I, I have now officially entered the world of the gentry. <laughs> <laughs> I'm, I'm making fun of it, but, but for me, this was a slight change of pace. Mm -hmm. and, and I love being able to paint somebody who I cared about so much and paint her at, at ease and in, in a kind of a, as I say, in a very different kind of um, atmosphere than, than, the, than the kind of New York City studio 
thing that I had been accustomed to throughout my 20s and early 30s. Definitely. And this is a painting of one of my stepdaughters, of Adrian Broom, who is a wonderful professional photographer. I think she, she at this point has had more museum shows than I have had. Uh, and she, I believe, was 17 when she sat for this uh, outside and painted this um, actually on the lawn of the Lyme Academy many years ago. And here I've just slid in an install shot so that we can get a sense of how these works are in the space, how they are under light and in conversation with each other. Um, I do want to be mindful of the time, so I am going to keep sliding through, but we will have a couple more install shots that, that we'll see here tonight. Sure, and I'm not watching the clock, Allison, so we, we, you can speed this along. Sure, we'll, we'll go through the remainder of these slides um, at a nice pace, um, and we'll, we'll leave ourselves around 10 minutes for, for Q&A. Terrific. This is um, my other stepdaughter, Marco Broom, and... Um, I think this is about, she was about 17 also when she sat for this in my studio. And, and I think this is about as close to Sargent as I ever got uh, in the kind of uh, ease and kind of uh, splendor, uh, kind of traditional splendor of the pose. Uh, and it just, um, it just seemed to work. You know, you, you take on when you're painting, you take on different uh, characteristics. At least I, I like to think that I do depending upon the subject and the atmosphere and, and where you are, you know. Right. Uh, Another familiar face. Case in point. <laughs> uh, this was done uh, in, in the winter a few years ago when, um, when I decided the world needs another image of a half naked old man. So here you go. <laughs> This is painted under, it was painted under a steady, uh, a bathroom light at night, mm. over the course of a couple of nights. And it's a reminder to me that uh, diet matters. <laughs> as does light, as we can see. Oh, very much. I <laughs> wanted to include a few of the, um, a few of the landscapes too. This was uh, 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 probably from the summer of 91 when I did a, a whole bunch of East River paintings and Brooklyn Bridge paintings. So this would have been done in one session uh, mm -hmm. standing on the, um, uh, what's that pier just um, just south of Brooklyn Bridge? Uh, it's got to be one of the small piers, like Pier 1, Pier 2. Well, it's, it's the one where they have shops, at least they used to. It's very commercial. Um, it's, it's eluding me now. But anyway, I was standing out there. They had restaurants and shops on it. And um, uh, one of our New York viewers will certainly know what it's, what it's called. Drop it in the comments, everyone. <laughs> if you know where Jerry was standing for this one. And this is a Brooklyn Bridge that made it. Uh, we did not paint over this one. No, I, li I like this one. I thought it was yeah. fun. I thought it was fun. And um, this is much more recent. This was just a few years ago. Standing under underneath a railroad bridge in um, Old Lyme, Connecticut. Uh, there's, there's an old, old railroad bridge that traverses the Connecticut River between Old Lyme and Old Saybrook that I think they're going to replace within the next few years. Oh, wow. Um, and it, it's, um, I, I, I've painted it a few times. It makes for a marvelous composition. And uh, you, can, you can hear the trains go right overhead while you're working. And, um, it's just a, a really neat spot. There's a, there's a walkway that they built there a number of years ago. So you can walk out uh, over the water there and, and paint from there. And this is a, um, also just a couple of years ago. This is the kind of thing I, I, kind of landscape that's idyllic to me and called to me from the time I was a child growing up in South Florida. To remember my parents were originally New Yorkers and uh, I was born uh, in the Northeast, but I grew up in Miami, North Miami. Uh, and this is the kind of landscape that just continues to call me back. I love the New England landscape. Uh, and um, I think this was painted also in one afternoon, if memory serves right. Just very florid and very um, full and, and something that just makes me um, delighted to, 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 be, to be chasing clouds and to be standing outside and, uh, in this kind of atmosphere. Uh, I love it. So it speaks to me in its own way uh, as, as richly as the figure pieces and the portraits do. Yeah. 
this is something that delighted me as well with the install shots to see the landscape side by side like this um, is really quite exciting. They're, they're lit so well, they're, um, they speak to each other so well. So I wanted to make sure we included this install Thank you. shot as well. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah. This is a portrait of Lori that's on the, um, uh, the cover of the, of the little brochure they made for the show mm. in a, um, a wonderful multicolored coat she had at that time. Uh, and here's that in context, I believe we have two um, portraits of the same individual. Something that really interests me here is the way the figures look at each other. And I'm curious, I know we're almost at that Q&A, but we do have a few minutes left before we transition. Um, I would love, Jerry, your thoughts on what is important with the curation, specifically of figurative works, because figures are always pointing somehow. They're looking or they're gesturing. So if you're going to see a, a row of them, what's important? You know, I really, I really didn't think about it in, in terms of this show because it was happening so far away and was out of my hands that I was trusting uh, the curator um, to do a good job. And uh, I, I received the most gratifying phone call uh, a day or two after the show opened in Florida from George Bolgi, longtime friend and the former CEO of the museum. And among other things, George said to me that... Um, uh, he stood back and he looked at the show and he said, that, he said, uh, Jerry, your father would have been very proud. Wow. Um, and that made my day yeah. because um, uh, insofar as we are, um, we continue to connect with our uh, families and with our parents, even after they're gone. Uh, one of the inevitable thoughts is I, I wish, I wish my dad could see this, you know, um, but, but he knew we take solace in knowing that he knew where I was headed as our parents usually do. Yeah, cheers to that. Moving on with the, the last image from, from this wonderful set that you've shared with us. This was also painted in, in the studio in New York in the early nineties. Mm. Um, and I think this was, I think this was a friend of a friend posing uh, and the, the background is completely made up. The floor in the studio wasn't really made of wood, but I felt like it needed, it needed that break. It needed that transition. I, I think the floor was white, was painted white as my reflection, just as the wall was, but I wanted to divide the space up. So, mm -hmm. and I also think that the model wasn't there when I finished it. So I essentially painted the hands without her there. So sometimes you have to invent. Yeah. Um, and, and this might have been an instance, I don't remember for sure, but, but to hearken back to where I got models, sometimes I would pay models and sometimes I would give them drawings or paintings in return for sitting. So that almost always has been an option. Wow. Sometimes I'll give away work as, a, as in gratitude for the model sitting. And, and sometimes I completely forget. One of the interesting things is living long enough to uh, find out that works of yours are popping up that I had yeah. absolutely no recollection of that. Oh, I gave that person that for sitting. Didn't have a clue. That really epitomizes the love of the practice itself and, and this de-emphasis on what is the end result of your work because clearly the joy for you is in making and you know where it lives after its completion can, can be anywhere. I think that's nicely said. I think there's some truth in that. Thank you. Cheers. So let me pull out of our slideshow here, um, and I'm going to take a quick look at Q&A. So bear with me, everyone, while I catch up with our backstage team here. And uh, a reminder that you know we are still going for another 10 minutes. So if you have burning question, a few comments, please drop them into the live chat. All right. So here's an interesting question. Thinking about these influences, um, and you you mentioned which are so based in realism. You also mention how a lot of portrait commissions um, are are coming to artists who are working from photographs. It's very important to you to work from life. So we have an audience question um, that is asking, what are your thoughts on digital art and people who are painting um, using technology? Um, the different, you know, programs that you can do to render digitally. 
Um, do you see this as kind of a positive or a negative direction for the art world or? Um, I, I, I suspect it's inevitable and nothing I say is going to change it. Um, as, as, a, as a truly, I hate to use the word Luddite, but as a, as a traditionalist in, in uh, what interests me is working from life. To me, why, it's almost why bother otherwise? Otherwise I'm just in the business of image making. Right. Uh, and I'm, I'm not just in the image of business making. I'm in the image of um, connecting thoughts and I'm in the image of, of being interested in spending time in, a, in an atmosphere, whether I'm painting landscape, do that from a photo, yeah. if I can help it. And the same with the figure, with people. It's, it's about being there rather yeah. than being there virtually or rather than um, depicting virtually. Um, many, many years ago, the great New York painter, Jack Levine, was asked um, uh, about whether he'd attended a shows at, at MoMA or the Guggenheim. And, and he said tartly, he said, um, I, I don't worship at those temples. Hmm. And, and, and without being glib about it, there's, there's a real truth to that. There, 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 there need not be an expectation that an artist and a teacher cast a, 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 an infinitely wide net. I think there's great strength in doing what Degas described, that an artist finds a place in the backyard and digs in that one spot mm -hmm. assiduously rather than feeling like you have to you have to embrace everything yeah i think that's a great take on it because it, it does sound like the work of digital artists you know it is simply a different temple it's you know if you're not working from life and working with hand materials you may be meeting different goals for yourself just as you describe these illustrations that you grew up and that lay the bedrock for why you wanted to paint in some ways, but that was not what you wanted to paint. These were images that served a different purpose than what your body of work serves. I, I have to confess, I missed the last 20 seconds because my connection is unstable. That's all right. It looks like, um, yeah, that might have been me as well. J just a sort of summarizing comment about this idea of, um, you know, digital art is, is people practicing kind of worshiping at a different temple, just as your early influences of illustration, they were influences, they were bedrock for why you wanted to, to make paintings, but those mm -hmm. were not the paintings that you wanted to make. Right. Yeah. Right. So, so I, it's fair to say that I don't feel qualified to right. comment or critique work that's coming from that arena. Sure. And here's a related couple of audience questions that I'm going to combine because of this, um, how central working from life is to your practice. I have someone who is incredulous at how you're able to paint en plein air with how quickly the light changes. Um, and another uh, question we have is just wondering about the speed of your work. It is, is working quickly something that you had to practice over time? Has it always come naturally to you to work quickly? Uh, first about plein air and then about speed. Uh, about plein air, um, well, actually the one question is you say it does fold into the other question. Right. Uh, Monet was hyper vigilant about that. He got to the point in his, in his maturity where he would take a dozen canvases out and he would, he would change canvases every 15 minutes as the sun moved across the sky because he was so very aware. Landscape painters tend to generally give themselves when it's sunny, and the light is moving, they tend to give themselves a window of an hour and a half to two hours. And then you reach a point where you say, it's just too different now, I have to stop. And that's probably true for me. There's probably a kind of a two hour limit on a summer day when the, when the sun has moved from let's say two to four or whatever, or 11 to one. Um, but the answer is it's a combination of working quickly and, um, and this, this, this damnedest kind of combination of observation and memory, mm -hmm. because what you're working from is always changing. So, so you're doing this thing where you're really making, even in a two hour oil, 
an a la prima sketch that you don't go back to. You're really making something in the course of those two hours that's a composite of light changes and atmospheric sure. changes. And you're making decisions on the spot about what works and what to keep. Um, and if you do it well, it's seamless and nobody knows. And if you don't do it well, you've got shadows going in different directions and the thing doesn't have any coherence. Yeah. So as far as speed goes, is it, is it innate or is it practice? And the answer is yes. <laughs> sure. You, you know, you, you get better at something clearly by practicing, but in order to practice, you want to be not good at it, but you want to be interested in it in the first place. And, and that, boys and girls, is what, what is the prerequisite for any successful artist is you've got to be really, really interested because otherwise, how do you slog through years mm -hmm. of training in anatomy and drawing and learning how to mix paint and mix color and do, do the thousand different things that you're doing as an artist? You don't become good at that generally unless it fascinates the heck out of you. Yeah. Uh, and so painting quickly is something that I draw up partly naturally and partly out of necessity mm -hmm. from working outside or working with models who might come and go. You know, there's no assurance I'll have more than a few sessions or even one session sometimes. Mm -hmm. So working fast isn't something you do to impress people, although people do like to go, ooh, and ah, you did that in an hour? Wow, look at that. It, there's a pragmatic purpose. It's about getting down your response, your notation as quickly as you can and as honestly as you can. Yeah, yeah I think it's, it's really quite inspiring um, how many times we've returned to this idea of enjoying the work that, that an artist does, like, you know, an artist practicing, having that connection to it for yourself is a really central thing. Yeah. Uh, with a couple minutes remaining, I want to ask another audience question. Um, one thing we haven't touched on very much is these multiple artistic careers that you have pursued, namely being an instructor and being an art writer. So I'm curious if you can just introduce us for the last couple minutes to what, what relationship to your art does teaching have and does writing have? I backed into all those things because art was, was really all I wanted to do. Uh, and teaching came up, as I, as I briefly referenced before, it came up, the opportunity came up a few times when I was young and I didn't finally um, uh, dig into it until I was in my mid thirties. Uh, and I sometimes ask myself, has teaching made me a better painter or, or not? Hmm. Uh, one thing it has done is, is, is it compels you to, um, to explain things and to talk about things and to learn things from your students. Mm. That's really important. You don't walk in the studio thinking, I'm going to dispense wisdom today. You go into a studio to talk about it, to, to give suggestions as best as you can, but you're also learning every day from the artists you're working with. Um, uh, it, it's important. I can't think of not doing it now. Yeah. You know, um, and I really do think in ways that I'm not even aware of, it informs the work and informs the painting. Uh, the same thing is true of writing. I really enjoy writing and I find it has a lot of parallels to painting in, in constructing um, uh, an essay uh, and writing about art. And it's very enjoyable. Um, but at the end of the day, if, if I never have to talk about or write about art again, it would be okay because you don't need to do those things to be a painter. Mm -hmm. they're, 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 they enrich life, you know, they're, they're, they're wonderful to do, but I don't want them to distract, you know, they, yeah. they need to enrich and not distract from, from being an artist in the studio. Great. Well, I think that's a perfect note to end on. So I want to say thank you once again, Jerry Weiss, for joining us this evening um, for your time and for walking us through this really incredible story of um, this exhibition and your full body of work. Um, so thank you very much. And to the audience tuning in, thank you for your questions, your comments, um, and for your um, attention this evening. For more information about humanity in art um, at the Museum of Art de Land, visit this website, MO artdeland.org. We will uh, include a link for that um, on the event webpage so that you can find uh, more on this exhibition. 
Um, since this is our very first live talk on YouTube, I have the great pleasure of saying like and subscribe. Uh, so make sure you continue engaging with our live chat. Um, afterwards, you can leave us comments, but hit that like, hit that subscribe button. Um, we will be back on Tuesday, October 26th at 6 p.m. right here on YouTube for another exciting live talk. Um, artist and League alum Alexis Rockman will be joined in conversation by curator Trevor Smith on environmental art in a program called The Sinking Ship. So again, like and subscribe and join us on October 26th. Um, please also visit our website, artstudentsleague.org to RSVP and to keep up with future events. You can also follow us on Instagram at ASLNYC. Once again, thank you, Jerry. Uh, thank you for everyone who tuned in. And as always, stay healthy. Thank you, Allison. <laughs> Take care.